Magnificent is the right word for these three objects, but it is a word with a fascinating and distinguished history, which we use, now use quite casually in everyday speech. What I want to do is to explore the world of ma medieval magnificence and how the idea of magnificence was related specifically to medieval kingship. First, we need to look at the word itself, but I promise you that after that technical discussion there will be a fine display of the objects and materials relating to magnificence as well as a gallery of the people who created it, from kings to cooks, artists and musicians. Magnificence <coughs> is a word coined by Aristotle in his book on ethics in the 4th century BC. Unlike his new, new, numerous volumes on natural science, the ethics is concerned with the philosophy of human affairs. In it, he outlines a system of moral virtues which should guide our behaviour. There are eleven virtues and, surprisingly to us today, the fourth of these virtues is magnificence which consists in the doing of great things in a virtuous fashion. He offers his, as his example a wealthy, public-spirited Athenian citizen who spends his money on things for the common good, building temples or triremes or endowing theatre performances. To do this, a man must have money as a poor man could not afford it, and he must be modest because the, the object is not to display wealth but to use it wisely. Aristotle sees magnificent actions as the hallmark of the personal virtue of magnificence. Now Aristotle, for the, with the rest of Greek learning, was forgotten in the early Middle Ages when only a very few scholars could read Greek. It was not until the 13th century, in the early heady days of the University of Paris, that his ethics were studied again. His works on science were well known, but the ethics were a problem and were the last book to be translated into Latin. Here was a moral system which owed nothing to the church, yet it was founded on reason, and reason was part of God's creation. This, radical scholars argued, gave the ethics authority in theological matters, and it was the balance between those secular morals and the traditions of the church, which occupied great thinkers like St. Thomas Aquinas. The arguments were heated, and it was one of Aquinas' pupils, Giles of Rome, who put forward a large number of radical propositions based on Aristotle in the 1270s. There was, of course, a backlash. In 1277, Giles' ideas figured largely among the 219 propositions condemned by the Archbishop of De Paris as being heretical. Giles was forced to leave the university. Apparently, also, he also left Paris. Rather surprisingly, at some point in the next seven years, the French king, Philip III, commissioned him to write a manual on how to govern for his son and heir, the future Philip IV. Giles's On the Government of Princes became a bestseller. It survives in no less than 300 manuscripts, one of the most common manuscripts of surviving from the Middle, Middle Ages. It was widely influential on later writers, 
and yet there has been no printed edition of it since the 17th century. Giles uses Aristotle's system of virtues as the framework of his book. He calls Aristotle simply the philosopher and he cites him endlessly. When it comes to the virtue of magnificence, Giles tells his royal pupil something which is not in Aristotle. Firstly, he repeats Aristotle's it is crucial for the king to show magnificence in works for the common good, which is fair enough, but he continues, it is the king's task to show magnificence towards his own person and towards persons close to him. This injunction is the key to the concept of magnificence in the 14th and 15th centuries. Before Giles of Rome, Magnificence is a relatively rare word. By the end of the 15th century, magnificence is everywhere. And note that this is before the Renaissance with which magnificence is usually associated. Following his advice, many kings chose to make the splendor of their appearance, their entourage and their surroundings, their first priority. As Thomas Hardy put it, who seems most kingly is the king. First of all then, we will look at the king's person. And here is Richard II in what is perhaps the ultimate magnificent portrait. The scholars of Paris were not the only people who read Aristotle. Alfonso X of Castile wrote a massive treatise on, on law in about 1265, which is in fact a fascinating guide to the whole of Spanish society. Alfonso tells us that the ancient sages established the rule that kings should wear garments of silk adorned with gold and jewels in order that men might know them as soon as they saw them. Alfonso had already put into place laws ensuring that no one except the royal family could appear in that kind of clothing. By an extraordinary chance, <coughs> garments belonging to Alfonso's fa son, Fernando, had <coughs> survived, preserved in the royal tombs in the monastery of Las Huelgas at Burgos. The embroidered cap and the belt give a very good idea of the brilliant colours of royal dress. The cut of Ferdinand's mantle is that of a simple tunic and clothing of the late 13th century relied heavily on the richness of the materials and of the embroidery. Alas, we have only the description from the royal accounts of Edward III in his Christmas gown of 1337. The hood alone depicted tigers holding court made from pearls and embossed with silver and gold, with a castle and a man riding towards it, and moreover between each tiger a tree of pearls and a tree of gold. The Chancery clerks obviously enjoyed writing up these elaborate details, but alas there are no images in account books. What I can offer you is, n instead is a little image of an Old Testament king wearing a very avant-garde pattern on an embroidered tunic as part of an English ecclesiastical cope dating to around 1320. In the early 14th century, the invention of the sleeve and of buttons revolutionized the possibilities of dress and later royal clothing is distinguished not only by silks and satins by fashion and, uh, but by fashion and design. By the middle of the century these fashions could be extreme. Witness this image of Louis, a men member of the du French ducal family of Anjou, 
who claimed to be king of Naples and, 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 and Sicily and Jerusalem. He married the Queen of Naples in 1352. This picture of him is from the statutes of the Order of the Holy Ghost, which he founded the following year. The length of the hood and the totally impractical sleeves are combined with a body-hugging short tunic made of white samite, a cloth particularly reserved for kings and bishops, and it is all in the latest court style. At the same time, exotic materials were imported from as far afield as China. Chinese silk has been found in a London excavation dated to around 1325, and the Chinese silk woven with dragons and serpents was part of the trousseau of Edward III's daughter Joan in 1348. St Edmund, one of Richard II's patron saints in the famous Wil Wilton diptych, painted in the last quarter of the 14th century, wears a similar Chinese silk, again in blue and gold. Next we look at portraits. The first realistic portraits of kings are surprisingly late. If you saw someone dressed magnificently, he was probably a king. But how did you know which king? Magnificence alone did not enable you to identify an important person you had never seen before. Portraits, in the broadest sense, are the modern way by which we identify people we don't know. But it is not until the early 14th century in Italy that portraits appear as realistic images. This picture of Robert of the I of Naples on the left is part of an altarpiece by Simone Martini of about 1317. The image of John of France on the right is also probably the work of an Italian pa painter about 20 years later. We also know that Charles V of France in the 1370s had portraits of his uncle, the Emperor Carl IV, his father, John II, and Edward III of England on a folding panel in his study, so that the idea of the portrait painting was firmly established by then. Now we come to the most important figure in today's talk. This is Carl IV, sometimes called Charles IV, because he was half French, but he was Holy Roman Emperor, and uh, that, as that's a German title, I use his German name. From 1348, to 1378. He had extensive domains stretching from the Baltic to the Adriatic and west of the French border. He seems to have used portraits as a methodical means of making himself familiar to his subject. No less than 70 portraits of him survive. Here are two of these and we shall see more shortly. He can't be described as handsome with a long bulbous nose, heavy eyebrows, and a generally slightly uncouth expression. But it is an unmistakable face. And Carl IV was a remarkable character. Brought up in the French court, his mother was a French princess, he was tutored by Pierre Roger, a famous theologian who became Pope Pope Clement VII. He was crowned five times, twice as King of the Romans, as King of Bohemia, as King of Lombardy, and finally as Emperor. He was a successful general, an astute politician, and a deeply religious man who wrote his autobiography at the age of 33. Two aspects of his magnificence his public magnificence. Mm -hmm. 
Magnificence was extended to the king's surroundings, to his family, to his court and courtiers, and to his artists and musicians, to the whole ambience of royalty. Magnificent buildings, such as castles and palaces, which Aristotle would have acknowledged as part of magnificence, were still included, but as an aspect of the king's personal prestige. Everything about the king's family, his companions, his surroundings, and even his personal beliefs could contribute to his magnificence, which in turn reinforced his person, position, and his title to his, uh, to his position. Carl IV, as Holy Roman Emperor, represents the magnificence of an established ruler. Bohemia, his first kingdom, was the heart of his operations. Prague itself was a modest capital, with a palace in ruins, when Karl first came there in 1333 as his father's deputy. Karl created, over the next 40 years, a new town larger than the existing city, endowed it with a university, and rebuilt both the palace and the cathedral on the Hradkani Hill, which overlooks the city. The plan for the new town included a processional way leading from the southern entrance to the Hradkani. Processions might be held when the emperor returned to his city or when he displayed a newly acquired religious relic. He accumulated over 600 such relics during the course of his reign. When he acquired the body of St. Vitus, the patron saint of Bohemia, from the town of Pavia in 1355, he sent ahead a triumphal letter to Prague announcing the for its forthcoming arrival there and it was duly borne in procession along this route. The most spectacular event was the procession with the imperial regalia when Karl acquired them in 1380. The crown was symbolically and visually the most dramatic of these. Nearly 400 years old, it had been remodelled in various ways. The base was and is essentially in its original form. It owes something to Byzantine crowns, notably the four enamel plaques around the base. This view is of the front of the crown with the most massive of the jewels. The arch and the cross were added in the 11th century. One day I would love to give a talk entirely about this object, the coronation mantle of Roger II. In brief, it was made in Sicily by Arab embroiderers who left a note of their names and the date 1133 inside the lining. This was only discovered during a late 20th century restoration, having been unseen for eight centuries. The two lions attacking camels symbolized the Norman conquest of Sicily, and a Byzantine style clasp at the top, you can see where it would fasten around the neck, has patterns representing the relationship of the heavens and the earth, so it was a highly symbolic garment. It was used as imperial coronations until the 15th century. A replica was then made for the use on such occasions and the original carefully preserved as a relic, which is why it's so resplendent today. Now we move to, I think, what was the major discovery for me when preparing this uh, book and talk. It relates to Carl's private magnificence, his private passion for the collection of relics. And it relates to the castle of Karlstein. 
30 miles outside Prague. If Prague is Karl's public monument, Karlstein is his private place. One writer called it his, uh, his castle of spiritual delights. It is magnificent in a very different way, a fabled treasure house to which only the very privileged were allowed access. The castle seems to have begun as a summer retreat. It then housed the imperial regalia before becoming a very focused religious centre. The two massive towers at the heart of the castle are perhaps rem reminiscent of the imperial treasury at Trifels in the Rhineland in their design security. When you arrive at Karlstein, the journey from the secular apartments at the foot of the tower, first tower to the chapel of the Holy Cross at the summit of the second tower is dramatic in the extreme. The first staircase leads to the quarters of the College of Canons in the first tower, whom Karl had established there to serve his new sanctuary. Their chapel is relatively spacious and wall paintings here depict Karl being given relics by the kings of France and Cyprus. On the right he is put, putting them into the Holy Cross which was a crucifix which doubled as a reliquary and was designed to hold, hold all the relics from the crucifixion which he had collected. From this first tower a narrow wooden footbridge is all that connects you to the second tower. The, the staircases too become narrow. They, were, they are brilliant with wall paintings honouring the royal dynasty and Karl's favourite sa saints. As you mount the stairs, the ceiling colour changes first from red to blue and then from blue to the starry deep blue vault of heaven before we come to the entrance of the Holy Cross Chapel. This is a space which has to be experienced. It is almost impossible to provide an adequate two-dimensional image of it. The entry is made all the more dramatic by a small airlock chamber before you step into this dazzling space of gold and semi-precious stones. Hosts of the saints and holy kings and queens look down from the walls. The, the ceiling is gilt gesso. The walls are decorated with semi-precious stones simply cut in half and very large pieces of semi-precious stone. Uh, the ironwork is all gilded and as the chief re relic is the crown of thorns which was the crown which Louis, St. Louis brought back from Byzant uh, Byzantium, which was uh, worn by Christ at the crucifixion. The, the uh, decoration is of thorns and um, on the top of the ironwork. What makes it even more dramatic is the painter who produced this. There is nothing quite like it in Western art that I know of. Master Theodoric, it's a Greek name, we know very little about him. He's simply there as the, king's pain, the Empress painter and he produces with his um, uh, assistants 130 of these portraits, most of them with these remarkable eyes which follow you as you uh, move through the space. It is a magical and very little visited place because it, there is no connection to Prague. You have to hire a taxi and go out there and that in, enhances the extraordinary feeling of remoteness and distance in time. Our next kind of magnificence is very different. It's competitive magnificence. We move 
only 20 years forward to France. Within the space of four years, from 1377 to 1380, the three greatest rulers of Europe all died, Edward III in England, the Emperor Carl IV, and his nephew Charles V in France. By the end of the century, both Richard II of England and Wenceslas, heir to the empire, had been deposed. Charles VI of France was 12 when his father died, leaving the royal finances in a healthy state. Charles, however, was the younger Charles, was excessively fond of festivals and tournaments and planned lavish, lavish ceremonials such as that for the coronation of his wife, Isabeau of Bavaria, at Notre Dame in 1389. The chronicler Jean Froissart got wind of it and went specially to Paris to see the spectacle. This is a later miniature, but is, it, is accurate in that it shows the citizens of Paris parading in their traditional half-red, half-green costumes and the Queen borne on a litter. Charles VI went dramatically mad on August the 25th, 1392. He was leading his army on campaign and was startled by a sudden noise. He believed he was under attack and drew his sword, killing five of his own men and wounding his brother, the Duke of Orléans. He recovered from this, but the illness recurred the following year now he imagined himself as made of glass and liable to shatter at any moment. And the illness continued at intervals until the end of his life. Isabeau, who was a, rem a remarkable character in her own right, became Queen Regent and she therefore assumed the King's role of magnificence. Isabeau undoubtedly loved rich dress and spent substantial amounts on it. She encouraged new fashions for women, such as wearing the male garment of the houppelande, a long gown with flared sleeves and a trailing skirt. Again, I'm sorry not to have an image, but the houppelande of Philip the Bold, one of the dukes on the Regency Council, for a festival in 1398, consisted of cloth of gold with seven spiral ribbons of different colours which ran round the body. Uh, it's almost difficult to imagine it. Isabeau also introduced new hairstyles, satirised by the poet Eustache Deschamps as Ariboura, which evolved into the horned he headdress known as the henna, shown as in this picture of Isabeau with the poet Christine de Pizan. It was perhaps not surprising that her magnificence, combined with her love of fashion, should lead to attacks on her by her opponents for extravagance. It is noticeable that male rulers were exempt from this kind of criticism. <laughs> the problem was that Isabeau and the three royal dukes were almost equal in power. They had substantial lands and substantial followings, which we've, we shall come to, but the politics of the next 20 years were extremely complicated and she steered her way through them. They were further complicated by extraordinary extravagance on everybody's part. We come to New Year's gift. Now, this is a very famous miniature. The tradition of New Year's gifts goes back to the strenua exchanged at the Roman New Year, and there are records of relatively modest gifts of this kind at the court of Edward III of, in England. This was nothing as to what was happening in the French court. The illustration for the month of January in the famous Très Richeur of John, D Duke of Berry, has been interpreted recently 
as showing the Duke's clients queuing up to offer him presents, while his court fool encourages them with cries of approche, approche. There you are, approche, approche, and the court fool beckoning him on. Between 1401 and 1416, the royal accounts report 7,000 gifts on New Year, totaling half a million tournois pounds, or rather more than the annual income of the Duke of Burgundy at the time. Sadly, little of the jewellery, which is the usual form of such offerings, survived because it was so often treated as a form of bullion and mel melted down, while the precious stones were put into store for reuse. By 1422, when Charles VI died, the French treasury was exhausted, and this was many when many pieces of goldsmith's work were melted down. The one surviving masterpiece and the French goldsmiths of the period were unsurpassed in their skills is the so-called little golden horse which was given by Isabeau to Charles VI in 1400. The king kneels on the left, you can see the enlargement, and beside him is his heraldic beast, the tiger. On the right is his squire holding his helm, and below is the royal groom waiting with the king's horse, a wonderful harmony of gold and white. The enamelling on the sweeping curves of the clothing was a totally new technique, and if the jewellery representing the rose garden surrounding the Virgin may seem over elaborate today, the design as a whole is wonderfully executed. Now, as I've mentioned, an intense rivalry developed between the Dukes on the Royal, Royal Council. This rivalry became a kind of competition in magnificence marked by personal badges which the, were the means of expressing both splendour and marking one's followers. When one duke adopt, adopted a knotty club as, as, as his badge, a, his rival adopted a carpenter's plane, saying he would shave off the knots with it. This illustration shows the king reclining on a daybed. His dress has a pattern of peacock feathers, one of his badges, and the bed hangings have another, sprigs of broom. Around the top is his motto in modern French, jamais, never. And I can't remember exactly what it refers to, but the, these mottos uh, run through uh, later magnificence, uh, right to the Elizabethan period, uh, at which point so a commentator writes uh, the obscure mottos of which the meaning is impossible to divine. The ferocity of the quarrels between the dukes was su such that two of them were assassinated. Firstly, the Duke of Orléans, by 1407, in 1407, by John the Fearless, son of Philip, Duke of Burgundy, and John the Fearless in his turn in revenge in 1419. This is a frontispiece to a pamphlet supporting John the Fearless and his actions, which shows their heraldic animals fighting in front of the royal tent. The wolf, Orléans, is reaching for the French crown and is struck down by the lion of Burgundy. Burgundy brings me to my last type of magnificence, which is ambitious magnificence. Burgundy, Burgundy's first duke was Philip the Bold in the 1380s. Now that's the Duchy of Burgundy that he started with. He married Margaret of Flanders, and the two were united on his death at 1405. And that inheritance passed to John the Fearless, 
who in a brief reign only added a few small parts but the real expansion came with Philip the Good and then finally with Philip the Good's son Charles the Bold. It's a huge state running right down the middle of Europe. The rise of the Duchy of Burgundy was made possible by the weakness of the French crown and particularly during the French English rule from Paris after the Treaty of Troyes which had passed the French succession to the English, uh, English kings and w the English ruled uh, again with a regency in the name of Henry VI in Paris. Philip the Good was wealthy enough to have by 1450 the most admired court in Europe. He was far wealthier than the contemporary Fre French kings and in any case Louis XI known as the Universal Spider was far more interested in intrigue than display. John Parston of the Parston Letters was sent on an embassy there in 1468. His awed description to his mother back in rural Suffolk is typical of the response of visitors. As for the Duke's court, I never heard of one like it for lords, ladies and gentlewomen, knights, squires and gentlemen, except for King Arthur's court. I have not the wit nor memory to write to you of half the noble events here. We know a great deal about these mo uh, noble events from the memoirs of Olivier de la Marche, who began as a page and rose to become master of ceremonies to Philip and his son Charles. He wrote a description of Charles of Bold's household as well as lengthy accounts of the marriage of Charles and Margaret of York which he organised and which was the precursor to the field of the cloth of gold and of the three great feasts held by Philip. Now I've looked at a very large number of medieval manuscripts and consulted other people and of all the wonderful miniatures in them I only know one which begins to give you some idea of what a feast was really looked like really looked like. I put on the left a typical illustration of a feast. That's what they managed to run to, three people at a table with a rather bare tablecloth. Um, and uh, it's in amusing because it actually illustrates the paragraph on magnificence uh, in, an, uh, in a treatise uh, of the 14th century. On the right hand side you have a bit more of an idea of what it was like because the medieval feasts had interludes which gradually developed into full-blown dramatic performances and this was a feast given by Charles V to his uncle Carl IV in 1377 at which they reenacted the first crusade. You can see the crusaders uh, boat arriving bottom left. That was the end of the first interlude and the second interlude was the sie siege of Jerusalem and scaling of the castle and they would have built a model castle in the uh, hall and literally as a theatre set. And that in fact is much more what the later feast festivals are about. In 1454, the most famous feast of all, Philip the Good wanted to make it the apogee of his achievements. It was called the Feast of the Pheasant because of a curious habit of taking vows on pheasants, um, I'm trying to remember what the other things are, uh, cranes, uh, various birds seem to have been the object of vows and the crusading vow was curiously taken on the pheasant. The feast was intended to launch a full-scale crusade in revenge for the disaster at Nicop Nicopolis in 1397 which had led to his father John Duke of Burgundy being captured by the Muslims. But there is no visual record of the Feast of the Pheasant. 
we have descriptions of the interludes from Olivier de la Marche, but we have to imagine the moment when a figure representing Jerusalem entered the hall on the back of an elephant and sang a countertenor aria lamenting the city's fate. The figure is said to have been La Marche himself. On the tables there were other musicians, an entire choir in a chapel, and a pasty with 24 fiddle players in it, very probably the origin of the four and twenty black birds of the English nursery rhyme. There are instructions in the cookery books as how to build a pastry to contain musicians. One other feature of the feast, which I can show you a little of, is the buffet. Now, it, our modern buffet derives a lo very long way round from it, but the buffet was the place where you displayed your best plate. Now that's a very modest buffet, as we shall hear, but it gives you an idea of a table in the centre with plate on it. And here are some of the plate you might find on it, such as the wonderful Royal Gold Cup in the British Museum, uh, the, the ewer from Copenhagen, the huntsman salt in the Ashmolean, and a Flemish beaker <coughs> in the Metropolitan. But those would be the kind of objects uh, which uh, you must imagine uh, when I read you Olivier de la Marche's description of the buffet at the wedding of Charles the Bold and Margaret of York in 1468. In the middle of the hall was a high and rich buffet in the shape of a lozenge. The base of the buffet was enclosed like the lists in a tournament for security, and the whole of it was covered in tapestry with the Duke's arms. From the base upward, there were steps loaded with plate with the largest pieces at the bottom and the richest and most delicate at the top. So at the bottom, were the great silver gilt pieces, and the top were the gold pieces set with jewels, of which there were a great many. And at the very top of the buffet, there was a rich jeweled cup. And in the corners, there were large unicorn's horns, very large and beautiful. And none of the plate on the buffet was used to serve food that day, implying that the Duke had enough to do both things at once. Such lavish occasions reflected the way in which Philip the Good had made Burgundy into a major power. He was certainly regarded as the equal of kings in power and influence. In 1430, he founded the Order of the Golden Fleece, which he is wearing in this portrait. It was soon regarded as the most prestigious knightly order after the Order of the Garter. In 1447, the, the Emperor Frederick III, anxious to obtain Philip's support, suggested that he might be created King of Brabant, one of his provinces within the empire, while remaining technically Frederick's vassal, which would have satisfied Philip's by then well-known admission to become King of in, in some, uh, to obtain the title of king. However, nothing came of it. It was left to his son, Charles the Bold, to make another attempt at this. Charles renewed the idea of kingship in 1472. He suggested that his only child, Mary, would marry Maximilian, Frederick III's son. In return, Frederick would make Charles king of the Romans, heir to the Roman, uh, Holy Roman Emperor. So on Frederick's death, Charles would be emperor and Maximilian would become king of the Romans. Maximilian would then succeed to the imperial title and to the Burgundian lands. Duke and emperor met at Trier on 30th of September, 1473. Frederick had intimated that he was rejecting the scheme. But Charles set out to dazzle the emperor, and indeed the whole of Europe. 
He arrived with a retinue of over 1,000 men in the most luxurious livery. The total cost of the clothing alone was almost 39,000 £39, pounds. If you think in the terms of 39 million today, you're getting somewhere near the mark. We have an image of the Feast of Trier. Unfortunately, it's a German artist working in the style of the time, which has nothing of the impact, it's pen and wash, and it has nothing of the impact of the French miniatures, but it does correspond to the description, and it made a huge impression on those who took part in it. A small book on the magnificence of Burgundy was the title of a tract written by an eyewitness. And it was so much in demand that it was quickly translated from Latin into German and Dutch. At the feast which Charles gave in the Emperor's honour, there were three tables, and everything on them was of gold and of silver. His Imperial Majesty, Majesty sat in the middle of the first table, and on his right, the Archbishop of Mainz, the Archbishop of Trier, the Bishop of Liège, and the Bishop of Utrecht. On the other side sat the high-born prince, Duke Charles of Burgundy, Maximilian, Archduke of em Austria, the Emperor's son, and the three Dukes of Bavaria. In the first place, 13 dishes were presented and served, ushered in by 16 trumpeters and 12 princes dressed in cloth of gold. Besides these 12 princes were another 100 princes, lords, knights and noble, noblemen, all clad in cloth of gold and silver, and according to his rank. Frederick III was not susceptible to this kind of display. By the 23rd of October, Charles realised he was getting nowhere, lowered his sights and demanded merely some concessions, political concessions from the emperor. This was in public. In private, the emperor reluctantly offered to make the county of Burgundy a kingdom. Preparations were made for the emperor to crown Charles of Trier itself before the end of November. But it all came to a sudden end. Frederick II announced on 24th of November that he was leaving immediately and went to his ship on the, on the river. One of Charles's councillors tried to delay him so that the Duke could at least bid him a formal farewell. The Emperor waited on his galley for half an hour for the Duke to appear and then ordered his rowers to start. This diplomatic insult, to the great shame and humiliation of the Duke, caused a deep rift between the two countries. The Germans were offended by the pompous and ceremonious language of the Duke, which they took for pride. The Burgundians were offended by the Emperor's entourage and poor clothes. Ducal magnificence was less powerful than imperial intrans intransigence. Throughout these negotiations, Charles was making plans to rebury his pa pa parents, Philip the Good and Isabel, in the mausoleum which his father had created at Champ Mol, near Dijon. This ceremony was probably seen and met, remembered by more people than any other event during the existence of the medieval Duchy of Burgundy. It involved journeys from Bruges and northern France of a total of 870 miles, 30 kilometers. The bodies were taken in solemn procession from Bruges and from Gosnay in northeast France, with torches blazing, a military escort, and chanting monks were walking alongside. Bells were rung in every place through which they passed on their journey. They struggled through tor torrential rain and floods. The costs of the reburial were huge, and a vast number of people involved. At each stop, hundreds of candles were used on occasion perhaps as many as a thousand. There were formal entries into towns such as Namur and Valenciennes and Dijon itself. In these and other times, elaborate burning chapels or catafalques 
with heraldic devices were erected in the churches where the coffins laid overnight. Why should this reburial, which had long been planned, suddenly be put into effect, postponed several times, then carried out in the depths of winter? The clue is that the operation was originally to have begun on November the 20th, two days after the date set in the negotiations at Trier for the coronation of Charles as King of Burgundy. After the rebuff from, from the Emperor, the whole thing was delayed and the journey finally began on the 2nd of January in the worst possible weather. The intention had been that it should be Charles's first royal act. Unexpected as this form of magnificence seems, it was actually the most effective, or could have been, in terms of proper propaganda. If it had been co uh, combined with his coronation, it would have been a truly dramatic opening to his reign. Four years later, Charles lived up to his nickname, usually translated as a bold. The French word is temeraire, as in temerity, and it implies foolhardiness. Charles has got entangled in a war with the Swiss, and outside Nancy in January 1477, he attacked the army of the Swiss and their allies with 5,000 men. The enemy outnumbered Charles's men by at least four to one, and the conclusion was to be expected. But the rout was so chaotic that it took day, two days to find the Duke's mangled body. The chroniclers remembered Charles by his magnificence shown on the left, seated in cloth of gold. But after his death, they wrote, wrote out his 12 magnificences. And this is where the magnificence had got to at the end of the Middle Ages. Maximilian, of course, inherited the empire because a marriage with Bur Mary of Burgundy went ahead <coughs> and it was united with the Habsburg domains and Burgundy disappeared from the map. So at Nancy, medieval magnificence came to an end and the way was paved for a different kind of magnificence in the Renaissance. Thank you.